Good morning. I'm Dr. Brickner, the instructor for Astronomy 2002 in Summer A of 2020. Uh, this is the Getting Started video for the semester, su Summer A. And we have a bunch of stuff, uh, 10 items on the list here. Let's get to it. And we'll start with planets. And of course, we have a great curiosity about the planets ever since the days of the ancient Babylonians. And uh, we've figured out quite a bit. For instance, we understand fairly well what the sizes and the relative sizes are uh, of the planets and the sun. Here's a, here's a nifty image that I stole off the internet. And it shows that 13 Earths could fit inside, 1300 Earths could fit inside Jupiter. So the Earth is pretty small compared to Jupiter. But then Jupiter is pretty small compared to the SUN. Uh, there's a thousand Jupiters that could fit inside the sun. And that's actually significant because that is one of the reasons why Jupiter is not a star and, and why we are not in a binary star system. We're just in a regular one star system. And it's all controlled by the, basically by the mass of the object. The sun's got it and Jupiter doesn't have enough mass. Uh, here's a nice image of, uh, Mars from uh, one of the NASA spacecraft. And uh, yeah, what is this big gash across the middle of it? You can see that it's kind of discolored and it, it goes from the left to the right. Uh, that's actually a water erosion feature. And think of the Grand Canyon uh, here in the USA. And that's basically this huge canyon. You can see it from space if you're close enough. Uh, and it's caused by water eroding this arid plateau down there in uh, Arizona and uh, in Arizona and I think in Utah as well. It's all part of the Colorado River system. The thing about it is uh, this one on Mars, yeah, it's pretty big. And this is how it would compare to the size of the United States. I love this graphic. It's up there on Mars. It they they have bigger volcanoes on Mars, and definitely bigger canyons. This is called the Valles Marineris uh, Canyon. This big gash, and yeah, it's larger than the United States. Versus the Grand Canyon would be a little speck down there in the uh, lower left part of the United States. So, and we want to know all about uh, Mars uh, because it's the closest planet to us that's semi-hospitable. Uh, it has an atmosphere. Venus has an atmosphere too, but it's pretty inhospitable. But, v but Mars we could possibly live on, and we especially want to know where all the water is. And that doesn't count just for Mars. We want to... We're, we're always looking for water all over the solar system, like there's water on the moon we now know. And there's water on the moons of, um, you know, the very, you know, like the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, which are, you know, there's a ton of moons for each of those planets. And for the exoplanets that we look for across the universe outside of our solar system, we're also looking for water on those babies. And, um, that's looking way, way far ahead uh, to when we can colonize another planet in another star system. But we should, by the time most of you are old and gray and starting to retire, we should have some people on Mars on a permanent basis. Oh, I, you know, that's what they think. That's what they're hoping for. The other thing that, you know, we're going to study this semester uh, is the uh, study of comets. And here's one that's uh, just been discovered. It's called uh, Comet C2020 F8 Swan. And Swan, it's, it doesn't look like a swan. Swan is the name of a, a, uh, a special uh, telescope on the satellite which first spotted this comet. And just a few months ago, 
So it's it's so new it's not even in our textbook. And because it's possibly going to be visible this month in June, uh, I'm going to show you kind of how to spot it. Uh, maybe looking to the northwest after sundown and low on the horizon. Now, here's a diagram from a nifty uh, website that would, allows you to figure out on any day of the year, in any year, at any time, day or night, where the stars are in the sky. And you can see here in this diagram that the constellation Gemini is in the west-northwest and on this day, Mercury uh, will be visible down by the uh, horizon in the west-northwest. And this is right after sunset. It's uh, 9.31 at night. And the comet that we just mentioned, C2020 F8 Swan, on this day is going to be somewhere down here in the northwest where the arrow is pointing. Now, the North Star is up here to the upper right, so if you know the North Star, you're good. Uh, if you know the Big Dipper, that's up here, Ursa Major. Okay, I'll show you another diagram of it. And so if you can find the North Star, or if you can find Ursa Major, um, if you know Mer Ursa Major, you can, you can find the North Star. It's the last two stars of the Big Dipper um, point down to the North Star. So that's kind of nice. And uh, the other thing that uh, you can use to find that comet, maybe if it's bright enough, we don't know yet, hopefully it will be, is, uh, you know, to look right after sunset. So it, the sun's going to set at about 8.30. This is what we call astronomical twilight. So it's not the dead of night yet. It's still a little bit of sunlight in the sky, uh, but it's fairly dark. And hopefully, you'll be able to see it. So uh, so that's my little blurb about uh, where in the sky that comet hopefully will be able to be viewed. And uh, here's another picture of the Big Dipper. So if you know your Big Dipper and the Polaris and stuff, you can you know, uh, use that to kind of orient yourself. You know, you're, and you, you can't do it from the middle of Orlando, obviously, because there's so much light pollution. But if you're outside of Orlando, if you drive, you know, up into Ocala National Forest or uh, down south of Kissimmee or something, or, or even west of Orlando, uh, but away from the interstate and away from the towns and stuff. Uh, and if you can see to the horizon in the northwest, you might bag it. So... And here's, here's a nice little comment that I like to make um, about the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. We could spend an entire year learning all the basic astronomy of Astronomy 2002 just by looking at the stars here. There's a huge number of astronomical concepts in this set of stars. And, uh, you know, so it's something nice to think about. Uh, now, an alternative to seeing the comet at sundown is to see it before dawn in the northeast. Right? So northwest is where the sun sets. Northeast is where the sun rises. So if you're up before dawn, now this is 6.05 a.m. on uh, June 4th, uh, you might be able to see it down here. Now, the skies are going to look a little different. Um, Cassiopeia, Andromeda, Perseus, they're going to be up above Auriga. Here's, here's Cassiopeia up here, which that was like the, let's see, second or third constellation I learned when I was a little kid. Uh, and every, I think everybody knows the Big Dipper. That was the first. Anyway, uh, so here's what uh, Cassiopeia looks like. Um, with uh, a couple other constellations in there. So uh, so somewhere down there by the northeast horizon, depending on if it's bright enough. I mean, it might be bright enough to really see it easily, but otherwise you might want to use some binoculars uh, either in the evening or in the at, at just before dawn. 
However, if you're going to use binoculars, do not look at the sun with your binoculars, not even the setting sun, right? Because you'll burn the retina of your eyes, just like Galileo did. Uh, also, do not use binoculars to look at the full moon because that's so bright, it'll burn the retinas on your eyes. Now, if you see a crescent moon, that's all right. But a full moon and even a half moon can damage your eyesight. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Uh, so anyways, hopefully we'll be able to see this. And it's nice to be able to see stuff. And, uh, you know, during a normal semester, I'd even invite you to go to the UCF observatory. But I think the observatory shut down, unfortunately, because of this coronavirus business. Um, so we're going to be studying other uh, comets as well as we go through, because there's some stuff about the orbits of comets and the orbits of planets that's actually fairly important for all of astronomy. So, uh, for instance, Halley's Comet, uh, very, very famous, uh, a very good bright one usually when it comes through the, solar, the inner part of the solar system. Here's a picture of the nucleus. So you can see it's like a... Like a uh, uh, a dusty, dirty ice ball, and it's gassing out all that, all that um, glowing area is the, the carbon dioxide and the H2O and the ammonia on the surface. It's getting heated up by the sun and then gets blazed out and, and, and catches sunlight and reflects sunlight uh, as it blazes out. So, uh, here's another one that we're going to study. This is wild, too. Now, this one's not blazing out a lot of stuff because this photograph was taken far out in the in the so further out in the solar system. So this one, when it comes by the sun near the sun, it'll it'll have a tail and everything like that. But this uh, photo was taken far out. Now, wild, too, is pretty important for us. And uh, we'll be studying it and other comets as well. Now. To continue the, um, uh, this uh, preview of where we're heading, to give you context, um, let's start talking about meteorites. Those are the chunks of asteroids and stuff that fall to Earth, and we call them meteorites. Here's Yamato 000593, uh, and this one's several kilograms. It's a fairly big one. You can see in the top middle of it that it's got kind of a crust, a dark, almost bubbly looking crust. And that's because it melted on the way through the Earth's atmosphere when it landed. And uh, it was discovered in the Yamato Glacier in uh, Antarctica uh, several years back. And we've been studying it since. And you know, Antarctica is actually a pretty good place to find uh, meteorites, unlike Florida. It's Florida's a little tough because we have all these forests. It's hard to see the ground without a lot of vegetation over here in Florida, but they don't have to worry about that down in Antarctica. Now, Yamato 00593 is typical of many meteorites. And one of the things that we do is uh, we study the chemistry of the uh, meteorite. We take little samples of it and analyze it. And one of the things that you can analyze is uh, the isotopes of each of the elements that are in the meteorite. And it's a, it, looks, it looks like a rock. It has a lot of oxygen and silicon in it, just like rocks of Earth. And uh, so when they analyze the oxygen isotopes, it can reveal a lot. And an isotope is a, is a version of an element that has uh, slightly more or slightly fewer neutrons in the nucleus than the uh, regular um, atom. And so the regular atoms of oxygen in the universe, the most I should say the most abundant, the ones that you breathe in most of the time, are oxygen-16. Now that's eight red, uh, eight red protons and eight gray neutrons, and then eight little blue uh, electrons orbiting the nucleus. So that's what this picture is. Now, there's other forms of oxygen in the universe that are stable. Oops, let me go back the other way here. Um, so here's oxygen-17. 
Okay, and oxygen 17 has nine gray neutrons. You can count them. And it still has eight protons that are red in the nucleus and eight electrons if it's not ionized. And we can find that on Earth, and we can find it in meteorites, stuff like that, moon rocks. Uh, and it, you know, there's another uh, isotope called oxygen 18, and it has 10 neutrons, 10 of the gray neutrons in the nucleus. Now, uh, what we do is we analyze Yamato 00593 for all three of these. Okay, and the numbers for Yamato uh, 00593 are um, 380.934 parts per million for oxygen 17 and 2014.9 parts per million for oxygen 18. So that's Yamato. And, and so don't worry about me memorizing those numbers. I mean, uh, but that's what the numbers are. And we'll be talking about those numbers for other meteorites because it, it can tell you a lot about the origin of the meteorite. And uh, so when, when we compare it to, to Earth, you know, the, the main reservoir of oxygen on, on Earth is the ocean, the oceans of the Earth. So we've done, you know, zillions of samples of, of the ocean water of Earth. And, uh, and we, we know how abundant each of those three isotopes is. And uh, the Yamato 00593 is a little bit different. It's a little bit more abundant in oxygen 17 and in oxygen 18. So what does that tell you? Well, what it tells us is that Yamato 00593 is actually a fragment of Mars that was blown off uh, when something else crashed into Mars, you know, an asteroid or a comet or something, made a big crater and ejected fragments. And Mars doesn't have strong as, as strong gravity as Earth. So if, if everything is, is just right, those fragments will go flying out into the universe. And they'll go traveling through the, the solar system, you know, little teeny fragments. And occasionally, uh, some of them fall to Earth. And that's what Yamato 00593 is. We even think that we know where its, where its origin was on the planet. We know it's from Mars. And they've figured out, well, up here uh, in this uh, diagram, there's a crater that they've identified. I identified uh, a few kilometers across uh, with just the right um, composition there. It's near a big volcano. Here's a big volcano. This is called Elysium Mons. It's a big volcano. And they study the volcanic, you know, Yamato 00593 is very similar to rocks we find on Earth. And the minerals in this rock uh, are very similar to the minerals on Earth. And uh, so uh, we can, you know, and we've had, you know, uh, rovers up there on the surface of Mars and landers that have analyzed enough of Mars now that we can at least make a, an educated guess about where it came from. So, yeah, Yamato 00593. And the interesting thing about meteorites and uh, asteroids, in fact, comets, we analyze the isotopes. Sometimes the isotopes don't point back to a comet or don't point back to a planet or a, a, an asteroid or the moon. Sometimes they point back to another star far away in another star system. And we're going to study, when, when we look at the analysis of WILD2, that comet, this is exactly what we're going to find. Uh, the other star uh, is, uh, in the case of Wild 2, is a red giant star. And uh, we're going to be studying stars out the wazoo this semester. Uh, that's our main topic. Uh, Betelgeuse is a red giant star. And uh, it's in the constellation Orion now. Orion's kind of hard to see right now because it's, it's approaching summer. And I think that what you might see it 
uh, early in the morning just before dawn. I'll, I'll have to look that up. But it's really, it's much easier to see during uh, the winter uh, and the autumn. You know, it'll be up after supper in the autumn and all through the winter. And, you know, Orion's, you know, the three stars of Orion's belt, very easy to see. And Betelgeuse is a red giant star right up here. It's the right shoulder of Orion. And then up above there, the Pleiades and Aldebaran and stuff like that. Uh, so, yeah, we, we're going to be studying all these stars. Now, red giant stars uh, are fixing a blow up. They're, and in fact, there's recently been uh, observations of Betelgeuse that some scientists were saying, well, it's, it's about to blow. It's about to go into supernova. Uh, but it didn't. It, it, it hasn't yet. But, you know, it's, it's hard to predict. But we think it, one day it will, probably. And a lot of times, um, a supernova uh, will leave behind uh, a remnant that we know as a black hole. And we're going to be studying black holes this semester as well. Matter of fact, um, SGRA star is a black hole at the very center of our galaxy. And this diagram is going to be pretty important for us all through the semester because, believe it or not, this elliptical path um, you know, where it says 1992.23, 1994.32, and on around. Those are the dates of observation of a star that's orbiting at a fairly safe distance, SGRA star, which is the circle with a plus sign in the middle of it, down towards the bottom of the ellipse. And from that ellipse, we can actually measure the mass of uh, of the black hole, or get a pretty good estimate of the mass of the black hole. And it's based on some of the stuff from the 1600s from uh, that we learned that uh, guys like Johannes Kepler developed, you know, uh, 400 years ago or so. So it's it's pretty cool. And I'll be teaching you about black holes. Everybody always likes to know about those. And I happen to be an expert. That's my, my research area is theoretical astrophysics, black holes, and the Big Bang Theory and stuff like that. So I'll be able to give you guys a lot of good information about that. Now, if you want to see this one, well, you can't see a black hole by definition. But you can look towards um, its location. It's in the center of our galaxy. And in the summer, it's fairly easy to see Sagittarius. SGR is the symbol for, or the designation for the constellation Sagittarius, which if you're looking in the south on a clear night, you know, no storm clouds around, uh, you, and you're outside of Orlando, you will might be able to see the Milky Way. And if you're looking south, you'll see Sagittarius, which looks kind of like a teapot. All right. And uh, right to the right of the teapot, depending on what time of night it is, um, to the right or, or kind of extending the teapot is the center of the galaxy. And that's where uh, the uh, uh, SCR A star galactic black hole. Now that's way, way bigger. That's the biggest black hole in our galaxy. And, uh, but it's down there. And we, you know, it's hard to see in visible light. So you won't be able to see it. Uh, and this data here, this diagram is based on infrared observations. So they have infrared telescopes and radio telescopes that can track uh, these things down here towards the center of the galaxy. The visible light's kind of hard to get. Um, here's an, and of course, here's the constellation Scorpius as well. That's easy to see in the summer as well. So um, yeah, let's talk about stargazing. Uh, now this is optional. If you if you want to buy yourself one of these things, um, this is a star finding chart. We call it a planisphere. It's in the shape of a disc, and you rotate it depending on the month of the year, the time of night, and stuff like that. And they come with instructions. Um, and this little job down here is actually for this one. If you buy this package, um, is uh, uh, a little. Uh, red light that you can use 
to view your star chart at night instead of a regular flashlight. A uh, regular flashlight will destroy your night vision, but this little red um, light won't. So here's the website. This is the one that I've been recommending for, you know, 20 years. Uh, David Chandler's product and uh, DaveChandler.com. And, uh, they sell, you know, they sell different packages and stuff. The other thing I would recommend, if you can buy it, and buy it for the right latitude. I, I can't remember what our latitude band is. I think it's 10 to 20 uh, degrees north latitude, or maybe it's 20 to 30. But you can look it up on their website, which latitude. If you're in Florida, and of course it depends. If you're in Florida for the summer, then you're good. But if you're up north, you want to buy a slightly different uh, planisphere for a different latitude uh, band, which, you know, that's good. Um, and then here's the other thing that I recommend. It's uh, a few bucks, a uh, small paperback booklet, uh, Exploring the Night Sky with Binoculars. And believe it or not, a pair of binoculars, you can see a ton. I mean, you can see the mountains on the moon. If it's a crescent moon, now don't look at it when it's a full moon or you'll burn your eye out, okay? Uh, and don't look at the sun in binoculars either because uh, you'll definitely burn holes in your retina. You don't want to do that. Uh, but you can see nebula. You know, Orion looks pretty cool if you can look, if you have a good uh, pair of binoculars. If, you, if you're into hunting and stuff, if you have a spotting scope, those are... Uh, it's not a binocular, it's just a one uh, monocular uh, telescope. But those are pretty good, too, if you have one or if your pop has one. And he'll show you how to set it up and whatnot. Uh, so definitely get that booklet if you – well, it's optional. But, I mean, the thing is in this class, you, you'll learn stuff and you can catch the bug. You know, and I'm not talking about coronavirus. I'm talking about amateur astronomy. And guess what? That comet that we were just talking about, yeah, that was discovered by an amateur astronomer. And uh, there's a lot of uh, cool th You can learn the whole rest of your life observing the stars, the planets and stuff. And uh, it starts, it can start this semester. So if you get the bug, um, go with it and enjoy yourself. Uh, and that's how I started back in high school, just stargazing stuff. Now let's talk about the textbook. We'll talk about, now we'll get into the nitty gritty of the usual syllabus type information. Okay, we're using the OpenStax Free Astronomy textbook. And the version that we use is mounted on uh, a server here at UCF. And on that version, um, I'm able to make annotations to the text, uh, which you'll see here in a few minutes. And uh, those are good because they reflect my emphases and how I think about the subject material. Now, it's not taken away from the author, but it does tell you what I think is important. And that's exactly um, good material to know what I think about the information, especially on exams. Because exams, if you think about it, I write an exam about the stuff that I think is important. You know, because we could spend years studying planets. I mean, guys spend their whole life researching planets. And other guys, asteroids. And other guys, meteorites. And other guys, comets. Other guys, black holes. Uh, so there's an endless amount of stuff that you could study. And so I have to decide every day. Um, you know, what to study with you guys. So, so I make those decisions and it's reflected on my exams. You know, what I think are important is going to be on the exam. So, so yeah, my annotations will be helpful for you. And they're all over the book already from previous semesters. Bear that in mind. Sometimes I make an annotation and I'll refer to a lecture and you'll have to say, okay, Dr. B was, and, and you'll be able to see the date of each annotation. So you'll be able to know, okay, he's talking about a lecture from 2018 or whatever, okay? Uh, but definitely they'll, they'll, they'll be handy. Um, now, you can go to the openstacks.org website uh, and use their, you know, same book, slightly different format, but same basic book. 
and you can study it there. And, you know, that has the advantage that you don't have to log into um, web courses to use it. Um, you can download a PDF of the text from OpenStacks.org. So, uh, you know, I think some of you may want to do that, um, you know, keep it on your desktop or whatnot. Uh, you can actually purchase an iBook or a Kindle version of the text uh, for a few bucks, and you can e and you can order one through um, Amazon. Uh, but of course, yeah, you can do it, but why would you want to? I mean, because it kind of defeats the purpose of having a free textbook. But you know, some students, I, I know some students were asking about a PDF, and and you definitely can get it from there. So that's our uh, free textbook, and uh, and uh, and we'll be using. Here's a little preview of uh, the textbook. This is chapter one, uh, section one point eight. Uh, and over here to the right, you can see a little number one, and that means I have an annotation there. And when you click that, it'll click out a little side panel. It'll slide the off to the right, off to the left, you'll still have all the text of the, the textbook, but then that little side panel to the right shows you my little annotation. And this one, I have a couple of paragraphs, uh, and I also have, if you look closely, I have a link: uh, Isotope Specs for Neon. Okay, so that link opens up this page on WebElements.com, which is a fairly nice uh, book. And neon is a gas that we're going to study. Uh, when we talk about, like, for instance, uh, red giant stars. And so, uh, so yeah, we, you know, in, when you're reading the textbook and you're looking at those annotations, um, you know, they can be helpful and sometimes link out to other enrichment material. Uh, so I want you to be omnivorous. Uh, read, you know, don't, don't just... Uh, Don't just read about what I talk about. If you're curious about something, you read about you read about it. It might not be on the test, but you know, if you get as I said, if you get the bug and you get interested, you know, it's it's just the start. Now let's talk about the basic workflow for the semester. And I know everybody's always um, you know anxious about learning how you know what are the basic things that we're going to be doing. I'll invite you to look at the mission control page. This is kind of my uh, layout of the semester. It's linked to the home page. Uh, and uh, so when you log in uh, today, uh, this week, uh, you can look at the mission control page. And you'll see a bunch of stuff in there. Uh, there'll be YouTubes and then homework assignments. And then the third column is different chapters that you can read. Um, sometimes subsections like chapter 5.5. Um, but, you know, as I said, you know, you read whatever you think is good. I mean, if you if you find something and you go digging around the textbook with the search uh, function, uh, definitely do it. You know, educate yourself. You know, I'm not your – it's not like high school. This is the university. So you're, you're basically teaching yourself. I mean, that's what we do our whole lives. We're going to be teaching ourselves and learning. Uh, so uh, start now. So um, here's the basic workflow. Start with my lectures in YouTube. Okay, now these are recycled lectures from the last time I, I had a lecture section, which was spring of 18. Okay, so they're a couple years old, but they're still pretty good. And they will, and, and actually I used them a lot. Uh, during the remote emergency for my for my other regular classes, uh, all my YouTubes and stuff. So, but anyways, it's spring of 2018. Those will be the main part of our uh, uh, instruction, right? And then you're going to have homework. And so you look at the YouTubes, and then you do some homework, and then you do the homework and you get it corrected. And then you go maybe go back and uh, reread or re-listen to the one of the YouTubes uh, associated with that homework. All right. Now you're also going to have reading to do in the free textbook and stuff. And I sometimes have additional readings 
uh, from around the internet, uh, a page of, you know, little readings and stuff. But anyways, you'll have some readings, mainly the free textbook. And that's associated with, you know, the lectures as well. So read, you know, if you hear me talk about it in lecture in YouTube, um, go read about it in the textbook. Use the search function in the textbook to find, you know, like uh, asteroids or uh, isotope or um, spectrum. You know, search on those words. If that's what you're interested in, or curious about, or you need to read more about, and uh, and and dig through the textbook. And uh, now the other thing is the reading will help you with the homework as well. So, so if you you know you do the homework and you're gonna have every homework is gonna have several attempts. So, um, you know, do an attempt and then go read or go back to YouTube or both, uh, and then take another attempt. See if you can max out your score, because the homework is really a study tool. It's not like you know, not like in some classes. It's basically designed to help you study. All right now, the other thing is, and this is just for this semester, I've just decided to emphasize stargazing because it is summer, and hopefully we'll have a few nice nights. Uh, stargazing, question mark, if possible. Right? So you, you know, you listen to lecture in YouTube, and you may get inspired. Let me see if I can find that star. Or let me see if I can see that comet down by the horizon. And of course, that uh, connects to the reading assignments as well. You may read something and then say, mm, I'm going to try to go find that in the night sky. And hopefully you'll be able to. And I, it's one of my favorite activities to go stargazing, although it's kind of difficult here in Florida. All right, so all of this stuff, these, this is all your study and learning activity. All that is going to point you toward the exams. And, uh, and that's when I judge how much or I, or I uh, estimate how much you have learned of the things that I think are important. So hopefully you'll get it, a lot of them. A lot of the exams correct. We, we usually have very good uh, exam grades. You know, it's hard to get an A. I mean, it's hard to get 100% because there's always a couple brain burners on there. Uh, but if you do the normal amount of studying, as I've shown here, and the homework, uh, you should be able to um, uh, do a, you know, get a, a fairly good grade on your exams, right? And the homework is going to help with your grade as well. So now let's talk about exams. You know, they say that uh, nothing is written in stone, uh, but that is not right because our exam schedule is written in stone. Right. So module one exam, Friday, May 22nd, it'll be available from 7 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. You have 70 minutes to do it, just like an electric class. And uh, but you'll be able to schedule it between 7 and 11:59 p.m. 7 a.m. and 11:59 p.m. So if you work a day job, you can do your day job, get home, eat a little supper, and then take it after supper, or vice versa. Module two exam, June 5th, 7 a.m. to 11:59, same conditions. Module three exam. Friday, June 19th, all the exams are on Friday, 7 a.m. to 11.59, same, same techniques. No final exam. Now, in a normal semester, I do have a final, but summer semester, no, we don't have a final. All right. Now, third column, is there a makeup exam? Well, let's check it out here. Module 1 exam, nope, no makeup exam for that. Module 2 exam, okay, let's read across. Uh, no, no makeup exam for that. No makeup exam for module three. No makeup exams. You've got to schedule your time. All right. You newbie freshmen that are in this section, you're going to have to handle it. I'm not going to go chasing after you like, you know, the assistant principal in high school with a tardy slip or whatnot. You've got to get your you know what together. Get your schedule together. 
Make sure you set your alarm clock, uh, set up your calendar with alarms, whatever it takes, uh, and get to each exams. Because if you don't, I, I, I figured it out. You could if you if you totally miss one exam, you can still get a B for the semester, but only if you ace everything else. All right. So that's pretty tough to do. I mean, getting a good grade on homework is one thing. But getting an ace on, on the midterms, that's going to be harder, all right? So just make sure you're ultra, ultra engraved in your mind these three dates, and you've got to be there. And I, I don't make any adjustments. If you have a job, you've got to figure out. You've got to get time from your job and tell your boss, I need uh, a couple hours to take an exam. You know, and you're going to have to drive home, take the exam, and you're going to have to have good internet. You know, if you have shaky internet, I can't do anything about that. So you got to take your exam somewhere where the internet is good and solid, and you've got to schedule it. I can't schedule it for you. This is your schedule. It's over. It's almost eight. It's 17 hours of availability. Now, if you have an eight-hour job or a 10-hour job, that still gives you several hours to get home. Uh, take a break, eat a meal, and then crush the exam. All right. So there's no, there's no, uh, there's no makeups. There's a lot of flexibility, and therefore no makeup exams. All right. So don't even ask me for a makeup exam. No early exams, no late exams. Just this. I mean, if you can't make it into this time schedule, um, you know, hey, you know, register for the for the lecture section in the fall, you know, that's no, or Dr. Cooney, he has a, I think he has a lecture. Well, it's going to be remote this summer, but he has a, a remote section uh, in summer B. So, uh, but he's going to be in the same basic situation. He, he'll have different dates and whatnot, but you know, it's going to be, it's going to be rough. So just get your, just get yourself organized. That's all I'm saying. And this, and, and let me just make one more point about being organized. And this goes for uh, newbie freshmen and seniors, and all and everybody in between. If you want to fail the class, the best way is to not take part in class, not do the homework, and not do the exams, or not or miss an exam. You know, bad attendance is the route to a failing grade and every you know last semester you know but i had guys that they they didn't make the final how can you how can you not make the final exam but we had guys that that didn't make the final exam and they flunked you know so it's just you know what can i, I you know it's university it's serious business and you've got to run your your schedule all right, the other place that you'll see the exam schedule is on our course syllabus page. All right, and I've already got that set up. And you can see different uh, exam dates and whatnot. Um, and here's the lower part. And you can see the other regular syllabus type information here. Um, here's the grade scale. Now, uh, one of the things I want to emphasize to you uh, is uh, this. I do not grade on the curve. Okay, so you have to earn points. And if you have the points, you get the grade. Grading on the curve is very unfair to students that are working hard. I, I just never, I never do it. I never have to do it. So don't even ask uh, me, hey, Dr. B, what about grading on the curve? Because the answer is going to be no. All right. Now, um, down here is the, the other place where you can see the schedule uh, for the different exams. And homework is going to be slotted in there as well. Matter of fact, I think now the uh, first four, the first three assignments are also in there. Also, you can see their academic integrity quiz. Uh, yeah, the academic integrity quiz and the academic integrity module is going to be our attendance quiz. Uh, for this uh, first week of classes. So try to get that done by Friday. All right. 
and that'll be then your financial aid will come through in the right time and, and everything like that all right now we'll do some more talking and we'll have some uh, online office hours this week uh, but hopefully this will give you a good idea of what's coming and uh, and uh, you'll be able to work hard for the semester so welcome aboard and I'll see you on the internet